That sound doesn't mean the basement is flooding, but it could be. But it does mean that How to Kill a Piano is here, and it's time for another episode. I'm George Tate. Thanks again for joining me on this story adventure and coming back week after week to listen. If you're not coming back week to week and you are simply listening to this all the way through to this point, thanks so much for continually listening. That also is pretty cool. When we last left our story, Charlie and George were heading off to the island to go visit Mr. Saprophagus. And that's where we find ourselves this week with How to Kill a Piano, Chapter 7, Mr. Saprophagus and the Intervals. Ernest Hemingway, Bruce Chatwick, Virginia Woolf, Vincent Van Gogh, Charlie Seferic. All right, maybe Charlie isn't as well known as those other guys, but he's as equally as influential in my life. I spent most car rides I had with Charlie asking him a million questions. He almost always patiently answered my inquiries. If he didn't know the answer, he'd never lie. I've discovered adults do that sometimes. They're so afraid of the words, I don't know, that they'd sooner make something up than admit the truth. I can't fault all of them. Often, adults don't even realize that they're lying. They've convinced themselves for so long that their personal truth and beliefs are the actual reality of the world that in some ways they've dreamed these worlds into being. You won't ever catch me criticizing anyone when it comes to wanting to play pretend but I've learned that those games become dangerous to everyone else in the world when other people's imaginations are allowed to lock out the real world completely. Charlie always encouraged me to read more than what fit my own personal dialogues by constantly reminding me, if you read everything that aligned with your personal beliefs, you're going to trap yourself into thinking that the world is black and white. In truth, it's a diverse rainbow. The problem is... Half the world is colorblind. Well, that's depressing, I'd respond. It is, though I find some comfort in knowing that even if half the world has shut themselves off from critical thinking and truth-seeking, that doesn't make the truth any less valid. After all, it's science. It's true whether you believe it or not. How do you keep it all straight? Well, George, sometimes I don't. Anyone can be fooled, and you'll become a fool if you ever think that you're immune to deception. One of my personal defenses is to keep my notebook always on hand to help me sort through it all. Charlie had many notebooks. Most of them were pocket-sized, allowing him to easily carry one with him no matter where he was going. Charlie loved his notebooks. At first glance, they all looked the same. With a closer inspection, each cover was worn in different ways. He'd carry some notebooks longer than others so that the black outside had faded into soft browns. The binding was broken on some and perfect on others. Inside, he always opted for notebooks without ruled lines. This way, he was never bound by the rules of format. It was a place he could be free. This was a place free of judgment, of spelling corrections, and absolute truth. Journals aren't a place of definitive truth, after all, but they're a place of passion. Sometimes, passion feels like love, and other times, passion is full of anger and frustration. As we drove across the last bridge and entered the island to visit Mr. Saprophagus, I asked Charlie one final question before we got out of the car. Uncle Charlie, why do you waste your time writing? I'd rather spend the day reading everything I can get my hands on. That way I can absorb as much information as possible. I write to make my head stop tearing itself apart inside. I rarely write poetry or prose with the intention to give it to someone else. I write to find out what's inside me, in my heart. You can't use your brain without your heart, so never ignore it. Being smart, George, it's important. But learning to love and have compassion is equally important, too if not more so. Learning to love yourself is as important as learning to love outside of yourself. Think about that for a second, or maybe two seconds. But 
don't use your brain. Use your heart, sport. Charlie parked the car and came around my side to let me out. He opened my door and the seatbelt made its annoying whirring sound as it made its way across and along the track, releasing me. You always seem so happy, Charlie. I got out of the car. May I tell you a secret? Please, I said, grabbing the bag of oatmeal that Charlie had made that morning. We started to walk the island towards the water where Mr. Saprophagus now called home. I'm not always happy. You're not? I asked, surprised. I do my best, but sometimes the world feels too heavy, George. Writing helps me put those emotions somewhere, rather than keeping them bottled up where they'd otherwise simmer until they boil over uncontrollably. Charlie took his notebook out of his pocket. This notebook is my heart. The heart is what tells us to make the right choice, even when it's filled with desires that contradict themselves. Hearts are a symbol of love and friendship, but they can also promote hate as much as they can promote peace. Hearts lock away our secrets and unlock them one at a time when we don't need them anymore. One day, you might find yourself thinking that to write from your heart sounds dangerous, but remember, don't let your mind get in the way. Follow your heart, and it will lead you to the places that you want to be. Strive for perfection. Got it, I said, saluting Charlie with the wrong hand. Don't worry yourself over perfection, Charlie chuckled. There's no such thing as perfect. Even when everything is completely right, it's not. If everyone was perfect, they would end up losing their minds. Being imperfect lets you realize what you've got. You wouldn't have a care in the world because everything would be perfect. And do you really want to go through life not caring about anything? What kind of life would that be? I responded with a nod. I heard what Charlie was saying, but it wouldn't be until later that I really understood it. There were a lot of people out on the island that day. This was our city park. It was surrounded by trees, walking trails, and open fields. It was completely surrounded by water, and the water on the outside was completely surrounded by the city. Streams and rivers weaved themselves through its centers. There was nothing quite like it anywhere else in the world. Some people came to the island to escape their day-to-day -day lives. Others came to live theirs to their fullest. We came to do both. Mr. Saprophagus lived down at the farthest end of the island, past the limestone lighthouse, across a walking bridge, and tucked away into a bayou that not very many people found themselves standing by. As we made our way to the water's edge, Charlie called out, It's Charlie and George! The water was still at first. Then it began to dance. It rippled across the surface as we watched the blue sky's reflection grow polka dots of orange as Mr. Saprophagus and her fry greeted us at the surface. I sometimes imagined Mr. Saprophagus with a voice. Charlie, she'd exclaim when she saw us. You brought us gifts. She'd warmly eye the bag of oats I was carrying in anticipation. Instead, Mr. Saprophagus was always silent, but she always seemed to know it was us when we were visiting. How are the kids? Charlie asked as I helped sprinkle the oats into the water. The fry of fish enthusiastically rose to the surface and captured each piece before it had a chance to sink to the bottom out of sight. They're looking healthy. I trust you're all staying safe and out of trouble. Charlie always spoke to the fish as if they understood him. Maybe they did. There were days when I'd watch him hold entire conversations as I sit with my feet playing in the water, and there were days when we sat silently, watching the fish. Today, Charlie got his answer. The fry loved the cooked oats as we left empty-handed, but with full hearts. As we made our way back across the walking bridge, past the limestone lighthouse, and down the path through the woods, back to where Charlie had parked the car, I thought I caught a glimpse of a dog weaving in and out of the trees. It reminded me of a creature I've seen before, but I couldn't place. Charlie loaded me into the car, and we drove towards home through the city. As we made our way back through the city streets, there were less people than normal. The first piano, I noticed, was set up outside our favorite haunt, the teapot. It was Charlie's favorite place to take me on colder days when we needed to get out of the house. It was a white, upright piano that had the words, Play Me, painted across it in red. Charlie parked the car out front. 
The plan was to grab some tea and then walk to the library a few blocks up the street to finish our adventure day together. As Charlie popped into the teapot to get our tea, I waited outside. I sat down at the keys and poked at them, not knowing what I was doing. I looked across the street and saw another piano outside the antique store. It was also an upright, but was in much worse shape than the one I was seated at. It had the same red painted words, play me, across the dash. Charlie came out with a steaming cup of tea in both hands and demanded, Let's go discover new worlds at the library. You'll have plenty of time to play one of those at home. I jumped down from the bench, and Charlie and I started walking up the street. As we approached the library, Charlie suddenly prompted us to cross the street to the other side. He was trying to avoid a man standing on a milk crate, holding a megaphone on the street corner before the library. His ears were pointed, he was dressed in a long coat and had a black collar around his neck with a white square at its center. He was unavoidable, even from across the street. As we waited for the light to turn green so we could safely cross back to the library side, the milk-crated man preached. Life, my friends, is nothing but death's hallway. Our pilgrimage on earth is but a journey to the grave. The pulse that preserves our very being beats our death march. The blood which circulates our life is floating it forward to the depths of death. Today, we see our friends in health. Tomorrow, we see them banging their heads on piano keys. Oh, how closely allied is death to life. The little lamb that plays in the field must soon feel the knife. The cow that lows in the pasture is unknowingly fattening itself for the slaughter. Trees only grow to be cut down. Yes, and greater things than these feel death. The piano with black and white keys that are stroked every day by the pianist, stands awaiting its musical judgment day. Stars die. It's said that large and destructive fires have been seen from outer space. The man seemed delusional, but he didn't let up. You see, pianos are directly plugged into nature's destruction. The poor elephants were hunted down and killed so the piano could have its pearly whites. Then we mined the heart of the earth itself to produce the plastic that now lines the keys of their modern counterparts. Trees that sway happily in the wind are torn down with the only sin they committed was growing. What a great sorrow that the good should die, that the righteous must fall. Death, why don't you cut down the poisonous trees, not the healthy ones? Why don't you mow down the poisonous plants? If you would to use your axe, use it on the trees that draw nourishment but afford no fruit. Then maybe pianos will be able to furnish from good, not evil. The man persisted. As Charlie hurried me across the street and away from the screeching voice of the megaphone, I spotted a third piano sitting outside the library. It had the same red letters painted across it. Charlie didn't seem to notice as we hurried past it and inside. Once we were safely within the walls of the library, the megaphone man collapsed into a pile of clothing. Had anyone been paying attention, he would have seemed to first vanish, leaving a pile of clothes only to moments later find a scraggly dog crawling out from between the leftover pant legs and shirt collars. Inside, the quiet was more soothing than usual. Down the street, screw tape and wormwood were hard at work, but they weren't alone. Every demon has their servant, and these demons were no different. The intervals performed the bidding of screw tape and wormwood just as they did the bidding of their own mistress. While they tend to be everywhere, you're not likely to ever notice them unless you were already aware of their existence. I certainly hadn't noticed them lining the streets as they watched us enter the building. Most people walk by obliviously while the intervals do their work. They're constantly toying with the fabric of our world, poking holes and setting traps that we're finding ourselves falling for. Or maybe we're human beings that make mistakes and we should stop blaming imaginary forces on our own flaws. When the intervals are focused on a task, they're harmless. It's when they get bored you have to watch out for them the most. Like anything, when they're not free to think for themselves, they're the most dangerous. Well, I have yet to see one for myself, I imagine each interval as if it's chubby and short. 
I've heard Mr. Screwtape and Wormwood talk about their teeth being sharp and jagged, so much that they could shred through the metal of a thousand doorknobs in a few minutes if they could only reach them. Doorknobs are their favorite treat, and Mr. Wormwood and Screwtape would often keep a bag full as rewards when they were done with a day's work. While well, we transported ourselves inside the library on imaginary trips to other worlds, Screwtape and Wormwood summoned the intervals to help unload piano after piano from the back of their moving van. One by one, the intervals piled out of the back of the truck, rolling a new piano out each time. It took five intervals as a group to coordinate a circus balancing act to scale up the leg of the piano. Pass a paintbrush full of red paint up the ladder they made of their own bodies to the interval at the top. They then scrawl the words, play me, on each piano and collapse like a house of cards tumbling to the table once they'd finish. By the time the library closed, it was time to make our way back to Charlie's car. The streets were lined with pianos on every corner. This made Charlie smile, but it made me scared. I no longer wanted to play the piano. Charlie's fingers danced along the keys of each as we walked past them. I walked between Charlie and the street, keeping as far away from the pianos as I could. When we made it back to the car, Charlie wasn't interested in getting in to go home. Instead, he sat down at the piano outside the teapot and started to poke around at the keys like I had earlier in the day. Charlie, I thought you said you didn't know how to play. I don't. Charlie began playing as if he had been playing for years. Then how are you doing that? It's like this piano is playing me sport. I never realized it was this easy, Charlie said with a smile. In a way, he wasn't wrong. Playing the piano is easy. If you can bang on the keys halfway decently, it can sound like music, the glass. After all, there seems to be an infinite number of people who can play at least one hand of Frank Lozier's and Hoge Carmichael's jazz classic, Heart and Soul. Even if they've never heard of Hoge or Frank. Charlie couldn't stop himself. I couldn't stop him. At one point, I reached forward in an attempt to close the fallboard, locking the keys away from Charlie's touch. Charlie's hands kept moving back and forth on the keys. I couldn't time it well enough so I wouldn't break his fingers. I tried to convince him to stop. Charlie, I'm hungry. Let's go home and make dinner. Charlie didn't seem to even know that he had become possessed. Soon, sport. This is fun. You should join me. Screwtape and Wormwood watched from three blocks away from the front seat of the moving van with a spyglass that they continually passed between them as they giggled in fits. <laughs> it's working better than I would have imagined, said Screwtape. If we could have lined the streets with pianos, why did we go to the trouble of delivering the Hazelton to their basement? inquired Wormwood. Have I taught you nothing, my dear nephew? The basement piano is essential to the plan. That's the key to how we'll scale this entire operation. Screwtape passed the spyglass back to Mr. Wormwood. Look at him. He hardly knows what's coming. I almost feel sorry for him. The back doors of the moving van swung open, and the intervals lined themselves up and marched into the back of the van. Mr. Wormwood dropped the spyglass to his lap in confusion. You feel sorry for them, Uncle? <laughs> Not at all, my dear nephew. <laughs> Not at all, Screwtape laughed. I climbed up on the piano bench and reluctantly placed my hands on the keys and found myself playing alongside Uncle Charlie. While we played... The dog that had been trying so desperately to get our attention through the megaphone stalked us. It leaped onto the piano, shutting the fallboard with a snap. It crunched down on our cuticles. I screamed as I grabbed my fingers. Uncle Charlie smiled. Whoa there, where did you come from, buddy? It was almost as if he couldn't feel his hands that had just been pinned temporarily inside the piano. His focus finally fell from the piano but not to me. He scratched the dog behind its ears, and they instantly seemed to become friends. Charlie had a knack for befriending almost any cat or dog in this way. Charlie! I cried. Charlie snapped out of it and saw that I was in pain. He scooped me up, put me in the car, and we started to make our way home. I watched the stranger chase our car almost the entire way back. When we pulled into the driveway, 
The dog was nowhere in sight. Back at the moving van, Screwtape slammed the spy glass shut in anger. That Sharon is a nuisance, and almost as stubborn as that child. A new plan, Wormwood suggested. A new plan, Screwtape agreed. Let's leave them be for now. Most people end up sabotaging themselves when left to their own devices. Luckily, we've implanted a device of our own in their home already. Won't she be furious if she has to wait longer? She'll understand. After all, it took her six months to create you, my dear nephew. Mr. Wormwood tossed the bag of doorknobs to the back of the truck. The intervals went at it like a school of piranhas devouring fresh meat. I think we may have opened a few doors tonight, Mr. Wormwood. Absolutely, Uncle. Absolutely. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of How to Kill a Piano. Of course, you can visit us on the web at howtokillapiano.com. Today's music was composed and played live to tape by yours truly, George Tate, with hints of derivative music from Chopin's Funeral March, thrown in for good fun, a la my personal arrangement. Thanks so much for listening, and until next Monday, I've been George Tate, and I hopefully still will be by the time I talk to you again.